Amen. It's a hard song to sing. Because if he's not more than enough for you, you'll look anywhere else to find what you think is enough. And the problem is all of those things are going to let you down. They're going to fail you. They're going to not satisfy the way you were created to be satisfied because only Christ alone satisfies. And sometimes, as Job found out, sometimes God chooses sovereignly to take, to remind us, to show us that He's enough. And the things of this life pale in comparison to him. Hmm. If you've lost, if you are struggling, if you are having a difficult week, morning, month, year, decade, he's enough. So what Peter wants to remind us this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, is that the gospel's enough. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Peter. We'll start in verse number 12 this morning. That's what Peter says. He says, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. We pray with me? Heavenly Father, we need reminded. We need reminded of your goodness. We need reminded of your holiness. We need reminded of our sin. We need reminded of our failures. We need reminded that we need to surrender all to you. That you and you alone are worthy of our praise and our sacrifice. And Lord, you alone satisfy completely and fully and abundantly. Lord, help our hearts to be reminded this morning through the power of your Spirit that your gospel is enough. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. So this section is kind of Peter's, I mean, it's his main thrust of the point of writing this letter. He knows that his time on earth is short. It's soon to come to an end at the hands of Emperor Nero And he's using what little time that he has left to remind us how we are to live and who we're to live for. He's not bringing in some like newfangled uh, theology or teaching that, that these people had never heard before. He's not seeking to sweep them off their feet with eloquent words of wisdom. He's simply going to remind them of the gospel. He's going to do it firmly and strongly to tell them what they've already heard and have already taken to heart. You know, there's a joke, kind of a dad joke, I suppose, but it stuck with me for, I don't know, I probably heard it in middle school for the first time. And it's Pete and repeat are on a boat, and Pete falls off. Who's left? Repeat, well, Pete and repeat are on a boat. Pete falls off. And because of the repeat, you just keep saying it, and well, it sticks. And Peter, that's kind of his thought here, that's kind of his point, is he wants to remind us of these things, what we talked about last week in verses 3 through 11. And he says that he wants to remind us three times in these four verses. Look at verse 12. I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Verse 13, to stir you up by way of reminder. Verse 15, that you may at any time recall these things. 
You see, Peter understands that we need things repeated to us over and over and over again in order to remember them, in order to recall them, in order to keep them fresh in our mind. We need things to be repeated. It's one of the main, main ways that we memorize things, like catchy jingles on TV, right? Which I'm beginning to learn my kids don't know. It's a huge negative, maybe, I suppose, element of internet TV. You don't have commercials. I mean, about the only live TV we watch is Curse of Oak Island, and they just make fun of me for that, or football, I suppose. Some good games yesterday. <laughs> they don't watch commercials, though, so they don't have the catchy jingles that once you get stuck in your head, you can't get them out. I'm going to help you catch some. Oh, oh, oh. Auto parts, right? You just know it. Or like, give me a break. Man, you're going to want a Kit Kat once you get home, right? Or I don't want to grow up. They don't even know what Toys R Us is. Are you kidding me? They don't know about the giraffe. How about this? They're magically, right? Are you hear them enough times, they're just stuck in there. Now you're going to want a Kit Kat and Lucky Charms to go to Toys R Us later. But the way we repeat things, they stick in our minds, and that repetition is critical for retaining memory. And Peter knew it firsthand. He saw it in Jesus' teaching. He kept hearing the same things over and over. They were repeated until they were just ingrained in his memory. Jesus repeated himself to make a point, to emphasize a lesson. He did it with Peter after the resurrection. And Peter and Jesus and the, and the apostles, they're, they're sitting on the shore of the lake uh, of Sea of Galilee. And Jesus calls Peter over and he's like, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Tend to my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And that interaction stuck with Peter the rest of his life. In fact, at the end of his life, here in 2 Peter 1, he uses the same word that Jesus commanded him to do in Luke twenty two thirty two. 32. Peter says, or Jesus says to Peter, right before his arrest and crucifixion, he says, Peter, Satan has asked that he may sift you like wheat to test you. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. But when and when, not what, but, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And that word strengthen is sterizo. And Peter uses that word more times than any other writer in the entire New Testament. Peter only wrote two letters, short ones too. He wants us to be strengthened, to be established, to be steadfast and steady in our walks with Jesus. And the best way to do that, he knows, is to remind us of what Peter or what Jesus has done, what, who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and what he's doing in you now. And you see, the thing is, is throughout Scripture, repetition is woven into God's plan for his people because God understands we're forgetful. He knows that we far too easily forget even what he taught us yesterday. We're forgetful creatures. We're inundated by today, the cares that, or the, the worries that come for tomorrow, the busyness of life. We just simply move on from yesterday. But you see, that's a problem when it comes to our relationship with God. And even in the Exodus, as God powerfully rescues his people from Egypt, even in that book, the people of Israel quickly forget the power and majesty and miraculous working of God, who just rescued them out of Egypt. 
He just made all of the plagues come upon the most powerful nation in the world at the time. He killed Pharaoh's oldest son. He made the, Israel, or the, the Egyptians to come and just give them all their gold and silver to fill them with fabrics and animals. And then, and then they get out of town and he parts the Red Sea and they walk across on dry land and then makes the waters flood back down on the Egyptian army. Like they just saw all of it. They see God come down on Mount Sinai and his power as Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments. And what do they do? Make a golden calf. He goes to lead him to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. And what do they do? Well, they're too scared to go in. So God says, fine, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God has Moses repeat the entire law to the people. The book of Deuteronomy. It's literally called the repeated law. That's what Deuteronomy means. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses commands the people. This is verses 6 through 9. He says, and these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, God knows He's just created a people for himself, a nation. And he's already saying, remember, remember, remember. Verse 6, teach them repeatedly to your children. It's not, well, they go to youth group or Sunday school or encounter, so I don't need to do anything at home. Yeah, right. You need to repeatedly teach your children the commandments of God and tell of his mighty works. Remind them of what God has done for you. If they don't know your testimony, then you're not parenting well. They should know the old you and they should see a difference in the new you. Let's look at what what God says. When should you talk about God? When should you talk about your word? He says, well, when you stand up, you should talk about him. He says, when you sit down, you should talk about him. When you lay down, when you go to work, when you come home from school, when you do anything, talk about him. Don't forget. He's like, even write them on your hands and across your forehead, your eyelids, so that you remember to talk about all that God has done for you and in you and through you and what God has commanded us to do and how beautiful that is. And look at what he says in verse 12 of Deuteronomy 6. He says, take care. Why? Lest you forget the Lord. Deuteronomy 7, 18. He says, remember what the Lord your God did. Verse 8, 8, verse 2. Remember 8, 18, 9, 7, 8, 19 to 20 even gives a warning of what will happen if they do forget the Lord. That they will perish just like the nations that God was driving out before them. Don't forget, it's that important, God's saying. The sad thing is, the Israelites did forget. In fact, Psalm 88, 12 calls Israel the land of forgetfulness. Consistently throughout Isaiah, he tells the people that they have in fact forgotten the Lord their God. Isaiah 51 would be a good example of that. See, we we recognize our need to remember and repeat things and remind ourselves in our daily life, like parents. That's pretty much all we do is repeat ourselves, right? Don't forget to feed the cat. Make your bed. Have you brushed your teeth? Have you brushed your teeth? Get your pajamas on. It's time for bed. Put your clothes in the hamper. Flush the toilet. Wash your hands, put your seatbelt on, tie your shoes. Where is your coat? Get your hat, wear your gloves. Your dishes go where? In the sink. Turn off the lights. That's a big one in our house. Seems like that's all we do some days, right? Remind them of what we've already told them, and we know we're going to have to remind them again in 15 minutes. 
to remind our kids of what they need to do. How many times have you reminded your kid that your coat doesn't go on the floor right when you walk in the front door? They know it. They've heard it a thousand times. They know their shoes don't go right there because now you can't open the front door. And the thing is, is they don't like being reminded, especially once they hit the teenage years. Problem is, as adults, we need reminded too. You ever miss an anniversary? Hopefully not. You ever miss an important date? You ever been late to a meeting or a conference because it just slipped your mind and it was on other things? Forget it was trash day before. That's a brutal one. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with all these bags now. There are things that we know that just simply fade to the back of our minds because it wasn't fresh. Business of life just keeps beating down the front door every day. We need things repeated to ourselves. We need things brought back to our attention. And the same thing's true spiritually. We forget who God is. We forget what he's done for us way too easily. And so we need to be reminded. And he calls us, Peter calls us to grow in that Christ-likeness. Not through, not through this ascetic, new theological teachings, not through new age methods that are really as old as the church, but instead to constantly be reminded and to recall the truths of the gospel that saved you in the first place. Look at verse number 12. I'm going to remind you of these things. Look at, look at what he says right after that even though you already know them and you're already established, steady, rooted in those things. So they already know the truths of the gospel, the church does. And Peter's like, I'm still gonna remind you of it because you need reminded. We all need reminded. Just as Israel was prone to forget God and what he had done for them, so are we. So what do we need reminded for? What does, it, what does it do when we hear the truths of God's truth and gospel over and over again? Well, I think there's three things in this passage it shows us. Looking at verse 12, it, it seems that these believers he was writing to were genuine, maturing followers of Jesus. They knew him. They were growing in him. They had surrendered themselves to him as we sang about in that song. They know what it looks like to walk with Jesus. They, they know the qualities that Peter had just listed in verses 5 through 9. The gospel had taken root in their lives. But he says that he intended to always remind them of what it looks like to live out their faith in Jesus. The oldest believers still need fresh reminders. And Peter, of all people, knew that just because you are grounded in your faith now does not mean that you will always remain so. Think of Peter. He said, you, when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus says, well done, nice. The flesh didn't reveal this to you, Peter. The Spirit did. Good job. You know the truth. And yet even Peter fell. He knew what it, how easily it was to be spiritually strong at one point, proclaiming the truth, that he's God in the flesh, the Messiah, only to crash and burn at a later point. I think Peter, he's speaking from practical experience here personal experience. He's trying to remind us, hey, don't make the same mistakes I did. Biggest regret in my life, Peter says, when I denied knowing Jesus. He's saying, 
I wish I would have kept these truths at the front of my mind. I wish I would have remembered. I wish I would have been reminded of them consistently and in that moment even. I, I, rem- I wish I would have remembered. Be reminded of the truths of God's word. It sustains the godliness that's already within us. You see, these are professing believers. They're walking with Jesus. And he's saying, you still need reminded. Even though you know them, be constantly reminded that it may, that it may cultivate still more godliness. That that would grow in you. That that would come out of you in new ways. See, the thing is, is you're either getting better or you're getting worse. That's kind of our motto at Football practice, are you getting 1% better today than you were yesterday? Because you're either moving closer to Jesus or you're walking further away from him. You don't stay the same. Kind of like a boat. When you use a boat every day or at least every week, it actually maintains itself better than when it just sits in the barn or the garage or beside it. Because boats wear out faster when they're not used. And as we see the light of Christ in his word, it will expose our darkness. It will draw us out more and more into the light. You'll have chances to exercise your spiritual muscles to grow in godliness rather than allow the sin that comes so easily so quickly, so naturally, to allow that sin to take a hold in us, to take background that the gospel has already won. Don't let your spiritual boat just sit in the garage, saying, well, someday I'll get around to it. Someday we'll get back on the lake. Use it and you'll be amazed at how much better it runs, how much better it's maintained, how much more your joy will be full. This is a good day when you're on the lake or on the the lake in the boat. It's a good day when it runs. When it doesn't run, it's quite possibly one of the worst days on the planet. Had a few of those days in our boat. In fact, I swam our boat back to the dock, to the boat ramp, when it started and then died and then wouldn't start again, from the dam at McBride all the way back to the boat ramp, that was not fun. But my kids were laughing the whole time, so that was fun. (laughs) Or when you're not paying attention and your uh, cotter pin's not in your propeller nut and your prop falls off right in the middle front of the marina. That's not fun either. But man, when it's running, woo, it's a good time. It's the same thing with our spiritual life, though. Like when you neglect things and then all of a sudden disaster comes and you're like, oh, crud. I have not been resting in Jesus lately. And you can see it in my life because I just snapped at my wife or my kids. I exploded and I, there was no reason to explode You see, yesterday's godliness won't suffice for today if you leave it unattended and undernourished. It has to be fed every day. The food it needs are the constant reminders of God's power, of his promises, of his holiness, of his love for you, of his call on your life, of his acceptance of you, of his adoption of you, of his forgiveness of you. Your godliness needs cared for by the truths of God's word because our natural tendency is to be forgetful. We're just modern-day Israelites. We forget just like they. And we look, we read the Old Testament. If you're like me, I read the Old Testament. I'm like, man, how stupid can you be? Like, you just walked through the water in the Red Sea. How do you forget already? It hasn't even been a month. And then... I look in the mirror and I'm like, ah, how stupid can you be? Like God just proved himself last week and now you're already questioning whether he's going to be faithful again this week. We need constant reminders. 
One moment we're willing to step between the two sides of the divided Red Sea. The next we forget the amazing rescue by God only to turn away from him because he's providing us with too much quail. God, this is too much manna. I don't want it anymore. I'm sick of it. See, Satan's gotten pretty good at wearing us down over time by the sheer volume of lies being poured out. What we never would have considered at one point becomes the next easy, logical next step if we allow ourselves to stay on the escalator. And the escalator's not going up, it's going down. Our natural tendency is just to, just to coast, just to go along for the ride. I just got to make it to bedtime. And then, well, then we start it all over the next day. And I just got to make it till bedtime. But God's word reminds us of what is best and what is good. And it stirs the holiness that's already in there. And it fuels it. And it helps us to actually fight against the tendency of the escalator to go down. We turn around on the escalator and we start to walk up the stairs to say, I'm not going that way. I'm going to make every effort, as Paul says in, the, in last week's message. Because we know that the escalator is not going to lead the way we want to go. It's not going to lead to what we think is good. It will not result in our righteousness. We have to grow more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. And we'll be more like him tomorrow than we were today. And there'll be times, like, it looks like the stock market number, right? Or line. It's not always up. Sometimes there's lulls. But our trajectory is going more towards him. And the way we do that is we preach the gospel to ourselves day after day. And it keeps the fact that God died for me. I've already been there I tried out that life. It didn't satisfy. Don't go back to it, like we talked about last week. We're already saved from that old life. I've already been set free from those chains. I don't have to live like that anymore. And as we see the holiness of Jesus on full display in God's word, we see how to live the new life, how to put on the new self day after day. And that's where Peter goes in verses 13 and 14. He uses... The word he uses to describe his body is a tent. He uses the word for tent, skenoma, a temporary dwelling place. In fact, he says that that tent is very quickly going to be all rolled up and put back in the package. His body was about to be put back in the bag. You see, our lives aren't permanent here. And he's emphasizing the fleeting nature of life. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And Peter recognized that his time was short, and as such, he's, he's writing with a sense of urgency. And what do you talk about when you know your time is short? What do you know when you, what do you write about when you know you're on your deathbed? You talk about what's most important. And in verse 13, he says his goal, to stir you up by way of reminder. Literally, his goal is to wake us up. That's what, being remem uh, what remembering the gospel truth does. It stirs us up. It agitates us up. It wakes us up out of our slumber, provokes us, stimulates us to prize the gospel in a fresh and invigorating new way. It's like we need, he's like, he, it's like this is what he's saying. He's like, you're asleep on your bed and you need woken up by a big old five gallon bucket of ice cold water splashed right in your face. Wake up! My lovely college roommates decided to do that to me one time. I'm kind of a night owl. I like to stay up late. College, it was worse. So then I'd sleep in late. I think that day it was maybe around noon or something. Might have been afternoon. I don't remember exactly. And they figured out a way to get up into my loft bed and dump this ice cream bucket of ice cold water on me. You want to talk about coming to reality real quick? Try that one out. And that's what Peter wants. Wake up. 
Be reminded of God's truth so that it will stir us awake, invigorate us, open your eyes wide. You see, these false teachings he's going to talk about in chapter 2 of these, quote, unquote, what Paul calls the super apostles, claiming to be better than the, the followers of Jesus. These false teachers were in their community. They were in their church. And Peter's saying, wake up. Look beside you. Reject the heresies that are being taught amongst your people. Grow in Christ-likeness. Become more like the Savior. And sometimes we just need that shot of caffeine to jumpstart our heart and our mind, to kindle the fires of our passion, to wake us up out of our stupor, to help us fight the fight and walk the walk and pick up our swords and carry our cross and break down the gates of hell and go and rescue the lost sinners who are living amongst us, deflecting the fiery darts of the evil one and telling those who are altering the gospel of truth what is true. Because it's under our very noses and in our very lives. And that's what the gospel does. It awakens our minds to the reality that there is a hell and there will be people going there for eternity. There will be, in fact, more people going to hell than to heaven. Because the path that leads to destruction is wide. It's the freeway. The path that leads to righteousness is is narrow and difficult. And the gospel reminds us that there are lost souls all around us. And it asks the question, what are we doing about it? There are false teachers promoting a lifestyle that will result in eternal damnation for those who follow in their footsteps. The gospel asks us, what are we doing to combat that? There are destructive beliefs that do not bring about the abundant life in those that we love and those that we hold dear. And the gospel asks, what are we doing and saying about that? And remembering that even your time, your time on this earth is short. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. We are not guaranteed 2024. And that should invigorate and ignite our motivation to get off of our blessed assurances and actually serve the God that we follow. To put our money where our mouth is, or maybe our feet and our hands where our mouth is might be better put. To actually serve him. To get off of our our lazy boys and our easy recliners. To get out of our sweatpants And to actually tie on our apron and get to our knees and wash the feet of those around us. Sometimes we need a a riveting pregame speech to fire us up, get the blood pumping. We need to remember the gipper. It's hard to take, it's hard to take the field when you're lethargic or when you're already defeated when you already think you're going to lose, when you already think there's no hope, you basically get off the bus at the opponent's field and you're down 14 points already. And then the first thing that doesn't go quite the way you expected it, now you just tank and the game's out of hand. Kind of like last night's game with the Eagles. Peter calls us to treasure the gospel. Rehearse it in our minds and our hearts daily to let the the good news of Jesus fan the flame of passion for him and for his kingdom to fire us up and to get us ready to go fight the fight. To ignite our desire to, to wage war for the souls of the lost in our community and around the world. To live radical lives knowing our time on this world is short and the master is going to be coming back soon. Do you believe that? If you believe that, how do you want to be found when he returns? Saying, yeah, Jesus, I, I was going, I was gonna, I was gonna work on those talents. I was gonna use your, 
your blessings well, but I, but I thought I had more time. For now, I was just living for me. I was building up my storehouses. I was building bigger barns for me. I didn't realize I didn't have tomorrow to serve you. See, sometimes we think, well, man, I'll just, I'll serve Jesus when I get to retirement, when life slows down. Or other times it's, well, I'll serve you now, but not when I get to retirement. Sometimes it's, God, thanks for the, thanks for the blessings, but I'm still the master of my ship. I'm going to steer where I want to go. And Jesus says, I want it all. Just as he told the rich young ruler, sell it all. Give it all away and then come follow me. There was that one thing that held him, that locked his heart in place. For him, it was his money. For you, it might be something else. It might be your job. It might be your, your grades at school. It might be your spouse. It might be your kids. Yeah, Jesus, I was going to serve you, but I need to run my kids to this on Mondays and this on Tuesdays and this on Wednesday mornings and church on Wednesday nights. Like, I'll give you that hour and a half. But then Thursdays, I got to take my kids over here. And then I got to do this for me on Fridays. And then the whole day on Saturday, we got wrestling tournaments and basketball tournaments and all kinds of other things. I just don't have time for you, Jesus. Sometimes we need to put on the headphones and listen to ourselves what our lives are saying without words. Jesus wants you to be reminded of his perfection and his righteousness that it might cause you to battle for your own holiness and righteousness, that it would invigorate you to pursue righteousness in your own life and in the lives of your household. And the gospel causes you to consider what you are doing with the few days that you have left, that it might motivate you to advance the kingdom for Jesus before he comes. The last thing in verse 15, Peter says, is that he will make every effort, he will do whatever it takes to allow them to recall all of these things he has spoken of. The verb tense here is future. Remember, Peter has short days. He's almost ready to die. Weeks, months, maybe. And yet he's giving them a future thing he's going to do. He wants the church to be able to recall these things at any time. He recognizes the need to be ready at all times with the hope and the power of the gospel. Reminds me of Paul in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 and 3. Paul tells Timothy this, one of Paul's last letters too. He tells Timothy, his beloved son in the faith, he says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. You see, what fortifies our readiness to combat false teaching and heretical beliefs, Peter and Paul both say the same thing. It's the preaching of the word. And it doesn't just mean from the pulpit or the music stand. It's in our own heads, in our own homes, in our own lives, with our kids, with our spouses, with ourselves. God's truth being spoken into our minds and our hearts. The thing that combats lies and the twisting of the truth, because that's what Satan does. He doesn't just straight up go 180. He just veers you off a little bit. Uses some of God's word, but twists a few of them to make it more about me, myself, and I. But the thing is, as we consistently hear the truth, God's truth as we hear the truth, as we read the truth, as we speak the truth, as we study the truth, you see, it stays fresh in our minds to the point where when we hear something and we're like, ah, that's, that's not quite right. That, that is going to lead down this road, and that's not the road that Jesus has spoken in his truth. 
And you begin to have a discernment in your mind as you, the more you understand truth and the more you hear truth, the quicker you're able to say, whoa, 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 whoa. This road is going north and we're supposed to be going west. And you feel it. If you can feel directions, you know what I'm talking about. If you can't, you're like, I don't even know which way's north. Maybe it's that way or over there. My wife's like that. Love you, sweetie. She's like, just tell me right or left. I'm like, well, you go north and then west. Yeah, what is that? But that's what happens as we hear the truth enough, as it's repeated and repeated and repeated. We're like, da 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 da. Yeah, Jesus said, yes, God is love, but that, that love is different than the love you're talking about. You're talking about a selfish love, not a sacrificial love. And you begin to see the nuances there and be able to hear those false truths and say, I need to correct you on this one. See, we have to be ready in season and out of season to refute the lies with God's truth. We have to be ready at all times because here's the deal. You don't know when the enemy's going to strike. You don't know when tribulations come in your way. Now, you can maybe guess once in a while. But you see, Satan's fairly smart. He doesn't hit us when we're ready and the cannons are primed and the guns are all loaded, and everybody's looking to the horizon, ready to start shooting at the first thing that moves, he waits until we're most susceptible to his attacks. He waits until everybody's asleep, and then he gets out of the Trojan horse. If he's already infiltrated into your base, because you've let those lies come in. It's one of the things I love about adventure is that you get to recognize where the Trojan horses are in your life. Where is it that I didn't even recognize that that was Satan's ploy? I thought it was a blessing from God, or I thought that was just the way life is, and God's word is used to refute that. And you push that Trojan horse back out the gate, and you aim all of your weapons at it. See, when we're in, when we're in dry seasons, or we're in emotionally spent seasons, or we're wrestling with the busyness of life, that's when Satan strikes. He doesn't make a full frontal assault. He likes to wait in the shadows and strike Mel Gibson guerrilla style like the Patriot. But Peter's point here is not just to call up truth when it's needed in the heat of the moment, but to consistently live with the gospel consciousness so that we are always ready to deflect the assault that's coming our way. You see, it's possible to remember that Jesus died for your sins, but to never embrace that truth in such a way that it overcomes your feeling of guilt from your past or shame. It never erases your dread for the future. It's possible to believe that God is sovereign, but to never actually equip yourself with that truth to live without the fears of what if or the unknown of tomorrow. It's possible to know that Jesus calls you to holy living, but to not actually allow that holiness to grip your conscience or inspire your hands and feet to actually live righteously. And that's probably our default in our style of church, to have a head knowledge, but not a hands and feet knowledge. I know what I'm supposed to do. I just choose not to do it. I know that this is true, but you can't actually see that play out in my life. Those are issues. What Peter is calling us to is to remember the gospel in intangible and practical sense that it would fortify and strengthen our daily readiness to live for Christ in the morning, to live for Christ in the afternoon, to live for Christ when we lay our head down in the mountaintops and the valleys and every day in between there, to truly live with the shoes of the readiness of the gospel strapped to our feet. You see, we need reminded, church. I need reminded, you need reminded and Peter's saying, we don't preach a new gospel. It's the same thing. So if you hear the same thing for the next 40 years from this pulpit, that's not a bad thing. 
It's a good thing to remind you of what you already know so that you continue to live in it and are strengthened by it. The same gospel that saved you in the first place, as Paul says, that Jesus died, he rose again, he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, he's coming back one day to bring his own to himself and to judge the living and the dead. And the question that the gospel brings, how do you want to be found when he comes back? Preach the gospel to yourself daily that it may transform you more and more into the image of Jesus day by day. And as we grow closer to him and more like him, our fingertips and our toes and our knees and our hips and even our bellies will begin to act and walk it out more like him too. Heavenly Father, we don't want to be Christians in name only. We don't want to be Christians with our mouth only. We don't want to be Christians with just our eyes. We want to be Christians with all that we are and all that we have and all that we do. Father, we want to praise you in the morning. We want to praise you in the evening. And Lord, we want to honor you with everything we do between sunup and sundown and even afterwards that you might receive the glory, that you might receive the praise, that you might receive the worship you are due because you and you alone are God and you and you alone save. It's in your name we pray, amen. It's all stand. All my sins have been forgiven, washed by the blood of Jesus. That's the only way you can be forgiven, washed in Jesus' blood, poured out for you, a substitution for your death, for your punishment. If you know that, keep preaching that to yourself. Keep preaching to yourself that you used to be lost. You used to be enslaved to sin, but God has rescued from that. He's ransomed you from that with his own blood, his own body broken for you. And keep reminding yourself of that because as you remember that, how could I ever go back to that? How could I ever Take his death for granted. And it'll cause you to live differently. If you don't know that yet, it's a good time to find that out. If you've accepted Christ, you're like, now I just don't know how to walk with him, come talk to one of us pastors. We'd love to walk you through that to help you learn how to walk with Jesus. We'll have a baptism coming up in a few months. If you haven't said, yes, I'm in, I'm, I'll die to self and live for Christ, come, come uh, dunk yourself, or we'll dunk you, I guess, to die to your old self and raise to the new, to represent that, to proclaim God's gospel in you to those around you. And if you have, go tell somebody else about it this week. Go tell somebody what God's doing in you. Remind them of the mighty things that God is doing. Stick around if you'd like to for CBC 101. Otherwise, church, go and be blessed. Oh, my.